I'm Dickie Climo, and this is my valedictory lecture. The valedictory lecture is an old custom in British universities in which a retired professor surveys for a, a, a public audience the field in which he or she has worked for 40 years or so. I gave my valedictory lecture in October 2016, but the video recording was unsuccessful, so here we are again in April 2017 giving the same lecture again. The differences are that there's a very small audience this time, whilst the original had a lecture packed, lecture theatre packed full, and we're using um, a plasma screen instead of the, uh, the ordinary screen with a projector. So, let's begin. It was in 1943 on the moors above Scarborough in Yorkshire that my mother introduced me to the bog moss at a point where she had collected it herself in the First World War for wound dressings. It was an admirable wound dressing. It holds a large quantity of liquid and it turns the liquid slightly acid. And these are precisely the properties you want of something that you're going to use for wound treatments. For many years it was in the British Pharmacopeia, but um, it was taken out of it not because of any technical defects, but for other reasons. It hasn't been surpassed by any artificial material. So, here is the object of our adoration. There are two species here, the red one with rather small leaves and a rather small head, and the green one with the much larger leaves and much larger head. Sometimes the sphagnum, as I will now call it, the bog moss, there's the name, um, occupies a whole area of red. This is nothing but sphagnum. And here's another sort of place where it grows. This is a peat bog, a large one, uh, domed, and we're at the top of the dome where pools develop, but the peat bog itself goes on right over there, uh, probably about uh, half a kilometre, perhaps a kilometre. This shows you the sort of um, differences in habitats that you get on a peatland such as the one I've just shown. You have places here with hummocks, in which are growing things like uh, Coluna, um, and Erica, the heathers, and an appropriate sphagnum that grows there has small leaves. It creates damp conditions around the stems. That causes them to produce new roots. The heather grows on, the sphagnum follows it, and so between them they continue upwards until limited by the water. Then down here we have a different sort of large-leaved um, sphagnum plants with cotton grasses and things of that kind. Here we have hollows which are full of water in winter but dry out in summer and finally the permanent pools here. This is the take-home message. Why are these things important? Um, the first thing is that in life the plant has extraordinary properties, extraordinary lifestyle, and is remarkably successful for a moss. It covers about 4 million square kilometres, that's 16 times the area of the United Kingdom, and about half of Australia. I don't mean it actually covers half of Australia, but it's that sort of area. And then, in death, it becomes peat, and it forms about a quarter of all the organic carbon, that's forest, grassland, soils and peat, 
about a quarter of all the organic carbon on the Earth's land surface. So it's really well worth working on. So, first of all, the bog moss in life. Why is it so successful? We'll look first of all at the structure and then at the functions, in particular nutrition, the production of acid, water relations and spore dispersal. Here is the structure of um, a typical bog moss. Um, it grows from the top here, it's known technically as the capitulum. There's a single triangular, upside down triangular cell which cuts off new faces round and round and round. Um, these then multiply again to form a little dome at the top, perhaps one or two millimetres across. They develop little bumps on them and these eventually grow out to be branches. Here's a branch and that in turn gets further little bumps and that produces the leaves. The leaves are unique in structure. The branches are of two kinds. There's ones which stick out sideways, the spreading branches, and there are ones that hang down the stem, pendant, and these are important for water transport. And you'll also notice that some of the plants will have these, which are originally spherical capsules, <coughs> which hold the spores. Here's a leaf. Um, the colour is false colour, and you'll see it has a pretty regular pattern, and the individual units of which it's made up really do look quite complicated. Um, here they are a bit bigger. There are the central empty cell with hoops of thickening, and then the live cells are the ones in between, surrounding the central, it's called the hyaline cells. You see it has great big pores here through which water can move in and out very easily. And here it is, bigger again. Um, there's a pore, not quite in focus. Here are the live cells, the dead, empty, hyaline cell. Uh, here it is in cross-section. Here's the empty hyaline cell, here's the living cell. And you see how small the live part is of the whole sheet. This is a chloroplast, um, the bit that uh, actually does the photosynthesizing, and there will be quite a number of those in each of these live cells. This is an artist's depiction from a scanning electron micrograph of what the leaf really looks like um, in three dimensions. You'll see these, um, my wife who did the painting talks about these as being um, seals basking on the sand. And you'll see the great big pores through which water can flood in and out. And the live cells are down in these cracks. You can't actually see the live cells. Again, the green is false colour. Now, how does it actually happen? Well, you start off with a single diamond-shaped cell. It divides across to form two. Each of those further divides, four, eight, sixteen. And that goes on until there are eight, nine divisions, and you've got maybe 500 uh, uh, diamond-shaped cells forming the leaf. It's what happens at that point that's extraordinary. Uh, here's the diamond, you get a further division, just like previous ones here. Although you can't see it, at that point there is a fundamental change has happened. Um, because only one of the products of that first division further divides and it forms two there. Then this one goes on to be the basis of a hyaline cell and these ones are the living cells. Uh, this one elongates like that, that one doesn't elongate much, and when that's gone on a bit longer, what you've got is something like this. The thick line shows the outline of the unit. Um, here's the hyaline cell, here is the boomerang shaped one, here is the one down here, and it's 
a three cell unit. One, two, three. Um, sometimes you get further divisions across here, not at all commonly, but uh, usually because something has gone wrong with the cell division. Nobody knows what controls this. What is the switch that causes the change? Um, how does it do it? But the whole thing is highly determinate. And here you see a leaf caught in the midst of these changes. Here the hyaline cell, there's another one that's forming, another one here, and these are what will be the living cells around. That matters because that pattern is unique and it's the oldest occurrence of it that's known is from the Russian Permian about 280 million years ago and you will see it's got exactly the same sort of pattern except that here you've got those third and fourth divisions in some cases. Just to put that in context, um, the universe is about 14,000 million years, the Earth about 4,000 million. Here's the Cambrian when you get the earliest records of um, animal life, earliest land plants. Here's where sphagnum is first discovered. Of course, it may have been around for a lot longer than that. It's simply that we don't know about it. There are sporadic records since, quite a number of them, at the time when the dinosaurs disappeared, the Cretaceous-Triassic boundary. And at present, there seems to have been a, 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 um, a sudden explosion of specification. Different species developed round about here. And nowadays, we have about 300 species. So the functions. First of all, nutrition. Now, because this lecture is for um, a public audience, and there were, may well be um, people who are not scientists, I'm going to show some of the detailed evidence, but for part of the lecture, I will be showing cartoons which show the, the principles. And I'm also going with this one to try to explain what a graph is about. Along here, we have the supply of some sort of solute. If you put grow more on your garden, that's what you're doing, and the more you put on, the further up here you are. And up here is the response in terms, in this case, of the amount of growth that's made. Within this range here, as you increase the supply, you increase the response. That goes on for quite some time, but eventually you reach a point where Although you're adding more, you're not getting any bigger response. And if you insist on going on ladling on the grow more, eventually you reach a point when it actually becomes toxic or poisonous. And this is the general response curve for anything that's ever been tested so far. That one is typical for a coarse grass. A fine grass has a similar shaped curve. It goes up, levels off, comes down, but it starts further down the supply scale and it, it becomes toxic much further nearer the origin than for the coarse grass. Within this range here, the fine grass will probably outcompete the coarse grass. But after that, the coarse grass overtakes it. And that's why um, you should not over-fertilise a lawn if you want to get fine grasses. So where does sphagnum fit in all this? It fits down here. Uh, same sort of shape, up, level and down, um, but right down at the bottom here. It tolerates, in fact it needs, only tiny quantities of solutes to grow extremely well. And if you give it slightly more, um, supplies that would be starvation rations, even for fine grass, it dies. If you pour London tap water on it, it dies. If you put it next to a piggery with lots of nitrate and ammonia, it dies. It needs tiny quantities, and indeed it can tolerate only tiny quantities. And where do you find um, suitable 
uh, habitats where there's only tiny quantities of solute, in acid areas, granite and so on, and particularly where the plants are entirely dependent on rainwater. Rainwater does have small amounts dissolved in it, and they're more than enough for sphagnum. Um, the mechanism by which it manages with such small supplies involves the keeping of what little it's got in the place where it will do most good. Up at the top, the capitulum, where there's plenty of light, enough water, and they have to have things like nitrogen and phosphorus in sufficient supply. And this can be traced with radioactive carbon and radioactive phosphate. Um, Hawkon and Radine and I did an experiment, and this is what the actual experiment looks like. This is at the end of the experiment where that's the dried plant, and this is an x-ray photograph um, of the uh, plant laid on an x-ray fill, and the black area indicates where the radioactivity is. Now, it's too complicated to get the message out of that quickly, so here's the cartoon. Here's one treatment, there's the plant, radioactivity applied at that level, and on the x-ray film you can see black there. You also see that there's a much larger amount up at the top. There is some sort of mechanism transporting carbon-14 and phosphorus-32 from where it was added to the top. Now it could be that there's a, it goes up the outside of the plants in those pendant branches. The water flow was upwards, that might be sufficient to do it. The other possibility is that there's an internal transport mechanism. Rooted plants have very well developed internal transport mechanisms, but um, the story when we did this experiment was that when you look at a cross-section of the stem of one of these mosses, you don't see any special structures that could be transporting. So here we have the critical experiment, similar sort of adding the radioactivity at this level, but this little section here, marked with an S, had been killed by steaming it with a jet of steam for a couple of minutes. And what has happened is that the radioactivity, as most of it stayed there, very small amount got transported up. Possibly that did go up in the outside. The structures were unchanged, but it's clear that most of the movement is actually mediated by some sort of special structures. And indeed, once we knew that they were being produced, Jeff Duckett did some electron microscopy and discovered that at the electron microscope level, you could see special structures. Next one then is the uh, production of acid. And here we have a little bit of rather basic chemistry. Um, some substances carry a positive charge, some carry a negative charge, electrical these are. And the positive ones are called cations, the negative ones anions. In rainwater, which is what the bog moss has to, it's its source of solutes, there are things like hydrogen, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and they are cations, positive charges, anions, mostly chloride and sulfate. And it's axiomatic that in a particular more than tiny region, the sum of the cations must equal the sum of the anions. If it weren't so, you'd be able to put electrodes in and get electricity out for free. Um, don't panic! <laughs> um, this top line here is one of the long chain polymers of which cell walls are made up. It consists of a six-membered ring with this group stuck on at one of the points. And this is a glucose molecule and collectively when they're all strung together it's cellulose. 
You know cellulose, it's what um, old-fashioned handkerchiefs are made out of, and cotton wool, almost pure cellulose. In real cell walls, there are some other things as well, but these are the, the basics. Now, sphagnum and other mosses have gone down a slightly different route. What they've done is um, used as their basic uh, molecule to be strung together a stuff called galacturonic acid. There it's written down, galacturonic acid, and it differs from the glucose because it has COO and a hydrogen. This is a neutral group. This one is actually a negative charge here and a positive charge here, the hydrogen. So overall, it's neutral, but it does have these, and the bonding between them is not very strong, and it's fairly easy for the hydrogen to be replaced by, let's say, a sodium, another positively charged iron. The chemists must forgive me here. This is all very oversimplified. <coughs> Here's um, a picture of what is actually happening. Inside the cell wall of the sphagnum, we have these long chain polygalacturonic acids with hydrogens associated with each of the COO minus, the carboxyl groups. This long chain is so big it can't move around at all easily. It stays where it is. But the ions can diffuse very easily. In the rainwater outside, we have a few hydrogens. There's one. A very few. I think that's the only one. And quite a lot of sodiums here. And a few calciums, which have two charges. And then the anions, which uh, balance the positive charges with negatives, are nearly all chlorides. Um, there's the occasional sulfate. That's how it starts. What then happens is that there is a vast excess of sodium in the outside. They get inside and they jostle with the sodium, and quite a lot of them stick in place of the sodium. Uh, sorry, jostle. The sodium gets there instead of the hydrogen, and the hydrogen, which is driven off, then appears in the outside here. If you happen to have got a calcium in here, it's particularly effective because it occupies two of these, and in order to be jostled off, you have to break both those bonds. So that's much less common than a single bond. And out here, you've got all these extra hydrogen ions, and that's what makes the water around it acid. The process is called cation exchange. It's what happens in a water softener, uh, except that there you start off with sodium on the resin, that's the water softener, the calcium in the rainwater that you want, in, in the river water usually, that you want to get rid of, exchanges with the sodium, stays on the resin, and the sodium comes out, but the water is then softer and doesn't cause soap to curdle. You regenerate it by putting a solution of common salt through it, then you've got so much higher concentration of sodium, it kicks the calciums off and you can start again. So cation exchange is the reason for the acid water. Um, in terms of the pH, um, here's a, a, an indication of the scale. Um, it, the middle, neutral, rather surprisingly is seven. I won't go into the details of why that should be. And smaller numbers mean more acid. Larger numbers mean larger pH, mean more alkaline. And you'll see that um, oven cleaner is way up here at 13. Um, egg white is just on the alkaline side. Blood, very slightly alkaline. Milk, slightly acid. Um, wine, substantially acid, lemon juice even more so. And the bog moss, common and the heathers, commonly exist round about here at a pH of about four. And a large part of that is produced by the bog mosses by the cation exchange process. Um, you can do simple 
um, calculations on this. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the details of this. It's just to show it can be done. And end up with a graph a bit like this. This shows the pH that's been achieved. The darker the grey, the more acid it is. And along here, we have different supplies of, of um, other cations, sodium, calcium, and so on, in the rainwater. And you will see, rather surprisingly, that the concentration of things in the rainwater doesn't matter very much. These lines are pretty well horizontal until you get up here, when it does begin to make a difference. What's really important is this axis, which shows how much rain uh, there is for a unit of growth. So that in winter, when there's a lot of rain and not much growth, you end up up here with a pH of, well, somewhere between 4.5 and 5. <clears throat> but in summer, down here, where there's a lot of growth with not a lot of rain, it makes things considerably more acid. <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that you can predict. It's pure calculation, schoolboy physical chemistry, and what's nice is that when you go out and try to measure it, you find that that's actually what happens. It isn't always so. Now, an ounce of experiment is well known to be worth a ton of theory, so I've got here a little experiment, and I'm going to, I hope that will make it more easily visible. Here we have bog mosses in a um, container here and a pretty near identical set on that side. Chemistry began in the kitchen and I've reverted to the kitchen for this. On this side, I'm going to water it with distilled water. And down in the bottom, you will see there is a small amount of distilled water with um, an indicator added, a chemical indicator, which is yellow when the pH is above 5, and when it goes acid, it goes red. So, first of all, the distilled water on this one. The kind of thing that children like doing. Not only children. And on this side, I have Best Sussex rainwater collected near the coast after um, a storm, so there's lots of sodium and chloride sea spray got into the rain, and we'll add that lot. The process of cation exchange is really quite quick, so it much less than a minute, and I can now open this up if, if it were proper chemistry. I would have a tap there, but beggars can't be choosers. And that's the distilled water. And I think you can see that the indicator is still a yellowish colour. Now we'll try this one, which has had the rainwater added. And you'll see that that one has gone much redder. That's the process of cation exchange at work. So we come on to the water relations. If you look at what happens outside on um, a peatland and you record the water level at a particular point, once a day, every day for a year, let's say, and then you arrange the readings so that the lowest one is there, next lowest there, next lowest there, and so on, along here. And these are cumulative times, and this is the height. And you'll see that there's this uh, S-shaped curve, and you can delimit half the time, that's 25%, 
at 75%, and that box indicates where the water level is for half the time. Um, you see it doesn't fluctuate very much, just two or three centimetres on either side of the average for most of the time. If you get a really heavy storm, it goes up here, but it drains off very quickly because the, the plants are really quite porous. Whereas down here is what happens in summer. Uh, the water table can go down to 20, 25 centimetres below the average. That 20 is something to remember. And in the autumn, the first heavy rains zip it up again quite quickly. So here we are, what does the conducting of water? The lateral branches, the spreading branches, allow water to travel sideways between adjacent plants. That's a very effective mechanism. The pendant branches allow it to travel vertically, a capillary effects in both cases. And the more the pendant branches and the smaller the leaves, the more effective the vertical transport is. So the species that grow on hummocks all have lots of pendant branches and tiny leaves. The ones that go further down sometimes have no pendant branches at all, the ones that live in pools. This is how the water gets about. Um, to measure this, uh, Peter Hayward and I built this bit of apparatus. There's an outer uh, PVC cylinder, sorry, to there, outer PVC cylinder, and here is an inner PVC cylinder. Water in the outer one can be added or removed and the inner cylinder goes up and down. And in order to average things out, the inner cylinder can be rotated slowly, uh, maybe 10 seconds a revolution. The sphagnum plants sit in this container up here. Here is a source of radioactivity, rather soft radioactivity, which is quite strongly absorbed by water. And on this side, we have a radioactive detector, various bits of electronics. Up here is a header tank. Water can be pumped down to cause the cylinder to rise or sucked out, allowing it to fall. And you can record from the detector there continuously. This was in the days when you had flexor writers, these ding, 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 ding machines. And from that, what we discovered was this. Here is the water table below the surface, down to 120 centimetres down. And here we have the water per unit dry mass in the plants. And if we start here and gradually raise the water level, nothing much happens to begin with. But then we reach a point where it's almost linear and goes up to about nine times the dry mass. If we now lower the water table, we come down a different route here. Um, this difference between going up and coming down is an example of the process of hysteresis. It's the sort of thing that makes magnetic tape recording possible. The important thing from the plant's point of view is this point here. Um, this corresponds to about water table about 20 centimetres below the average. You remember I pointed out 20 is important. Um, it goes up like that and then if the water table begins to drop, it can come down to here and at three times the amount of water of dry matter, it's still photosynthesizing. You have light as well, of course. When you're going in the opposite direction, the same point, 20%, there's only one mass of water to a mass of the plant, and you cannot photosynthesize there. So this is um, a very powerful mechanism which keeps the plants photosynthesizing during periods when it's going dry, 
it doesn't have any substantial effect when there's a lot of water around. I'd have been proud to design something like that. And lastly, we come to the spore dispersal. Uh, the capsules, which I mentioned, look like this. They start off, they'll be perhaps one, two millimetres across. And this is what they're like in section. They've got the outer coating, and here are all the spores, millions of them. You'll notice that there's a line of weakness here. You can scarcely see it, but uh, it, it is there. And as the water evaporates from these, the sphere shrinks down and becomes a four-sided uh, vertical pillar. And eventually, the top blows off. As it's shrunk down, it's increased the pressure, and the top cap is blown off. And here it is happening. There, the cap has gone, and here, the spores are entrained in a vortex, a sort of donut. Vortices have a life of their own. Um, they're quite difficult to destroy and they last a long time. So the spores are carried up to a height of about 10 centimetres above the surface. Most mosses have a, a shaking system like a pepper pot. Um, the the, the shake a bit, the spores drop out, but they fall close by where the plant itself is. This one gives them much wider dispersal. Here it is again. Look down here for when the spores, when the cap blows off. There it goes. And there they are being carried up. A most beautiful mechanism. So, the spores get well up into where they can be dispersed. The molecular structure of sphagnum plants in North America is virtually the same as that of the same species in Europe. The suggestion is that the spores are easily circulated around the world, in the, uh, well up in the atmosphere. There's a place on Kenwood where the lawn was ploughed up for potato growing during the Second World War. At the end of the war, it reverted to grassland. Uh, there's a small spring that comes from just below the capping of bagshot sand, which is slightly acid. And within 10 years, there were eight different species of sphagnum had appeared in the, this little valley. They have extremely effective ways of spreading it around. So here we are, tiny supply of root nutrients. It makes extraordinarily good use of what it's got. More effective about this than any other plant that's been recorded in terms of the nitrogen and phosphorus that it's got. Um, makes the water acid. I haven't said, but nothing grazes it. Uh, not entirely clear why, uh, but perhaps it's just not worth all the effort um, you get so little nitrogen and phosphorus for, for doing it. And a very effective water transport system. And finally, the spore production. So put these things together and with the environment and very few rooted plants can actually grow well there. So there's not a lot of competition. Um, this is a sporting comment. It's a game of two halves, and we now go to the second half, which is a bit shorter than the first, the afterlife of the bog moss. If you take a core, this is what it looks like. Um, what were once live plants but have dried now there. Um, here's the ones that were formed earlier. Uh, the growth occurs only at the top. And you'll see there are quite distinct zones here. To begin with, this is very porous, and extra water flows off sideways easily. But eventually you get to a point where the weight of this wet stuff above causes the now weakened um, plant remains here to collapse. 
decay is going on throughout this process. It's producing mostly carbon dioxide and it's mostly um, affected by fungi. Once you get to this zone, there's then a zone like that where there's a lot of things going on, but essentially the spaces have contracted down and the water can no longer flow at all easily. And further down still, it becomes permanently waterlogged. Um, oxygen diffuses at only one ten thousandth the rate in water that it does in air. So the microorganisms there, mostly bacteria now, use up the oxygen faster than it can diffuse down. It's a dynamic process. Make it anoxic, and that then means that a totally different set of microorganisms take over. All of them bacteria, um, they decay very much more slowly than the um, fungi in the top layers were able to do. Um, here's some actual measurements on this. There's a cartoon of the plants and a, um, a cotton grass growing in them. Here's the dry bulk density. That's the amount of dry matter in a given volume. And it starts off around about here, about 1 20th. And then you get to the point where things collapse and it goes up rapidly to twice or three times what it had been in the surface. That's about 10 centimetres down in this case. And you can convert that into an indication of gas, liquid and solid. Here's the liquid proportion here. Starts off at about 40% and becomes 95% or more. Here's the amount of gas in this triangle here. A lot at the top, but decreasing. And here is the solid. And you'll see that the amount of solid in a given um, volume increases here because the whole thing has collapsed down. But even so, there's only 5 7% of solid material. And if you walk across a peat bog, it's the nearest that you will ever get to walking on water. Um, milk has about the same amount of solid in it. You can't walk on milk. So this is summarizing what I've just said. The top 20 centimeters permeable, allow air circulation and this abundant oxygen. Uh, the decay of the, in these top layers, a lot of it runs off as a brown dissolved organic matter, DOM, or dissolved organic carbon, DOC. And a lot of it is dispersed into the air as carbon dioxide and some methane. Here is Jim Redaway making some of the first measurements, in fact the first measurements that were ever made of the amount of gas coming off from a peatland. This was in the early 1970s. The collectors, stainless steel, pushed in permanently. This is a looking down on top of it and it's got a channel in the top here. You place a polythene uh, with bucket upside down in there. You pour in water into the channel so it seals it. If the temperature goes up and the gas expands, a bubble or two come out. If it goes down, the reverse happens and a bit of air gets in. But it's small compared with the total volume. And you sample through the top after a given time. In our case, it was after a day. Uh, nowadays, they're done every 20 minutes or so. So those were the first measurements and we did, I think, about 15 of them. And from that we discovered two fairly obvious things. The first was that on hummocks there was more carbon dioxide than methane coming off. The reverse was true in pools and the amount coming off from pools was erratic. Um, sometimes there was a much higher amount and we thought that was probably gas bubbles which had got in at that particular time. 
since that time, there are tens of millions of these sorts of measurements have been made. Automatic equipment, um, containers with lids which go up and down at the command, uh, and even cleverer ways of doing it. So what this showed was that about 80% of the plant matter disappears uh, before the water table rises and the compression happens and it becomes anoxic. So now we're into the peat proper. Um, and this is the thing that matters here. Here's the relative amounts of carbon in gigatons um, in the atmosphere, in the peat, and in all other sorts. Um, so the peat is about a quarter of all the organic carbon on the Earth's surface. Um, going back again to this picture, we've now got to this point. There's this zone where there's interesting things happen, um, and then we get into the anoxic zone where the decay is much slower than it is up here, probably a thousand times slower. And you can see that there are different things happening. Here is a bamboo that was stuck in and left there for several years. Here it's the, what happened above the surface. You've got lichens beginning to grow. Here is in amongst the sphagnum at the top. Then we come to this zone, which is blackened, where interesting things, great variation in the biochemistry. And finally, we get into this, which is the permanently anoxic. Uh, growth rate about one millimetre a year on average, rule of thumb. Um, back down here, the Roman invasion, 54 before the uh, Christian era. Uh, halfway along, William the Conqueror, and here we are now. So about a metre every thousand years. Now here we have a little clip from an old Horizon program. The balance of growth and decay is there in our forests, in our fields. But the balance between growth and decay may be changing. And the perfect example is in a peat bog. This will give you some idea of the what fieldwork is like. Built up thousands of years of peat, growing on top, decomposing below. At Loch D, Elagar Moss has built up thousands of years of fascination for a dedicated academic. For 25 years, Dickie Climo has been working on peat. He's been trying to measure decomposition deep down in the bog. Yes, that's a good one. The surface there is the same height as it is outside. So it has... It's not a fashionable branch of science, and Dickie has had to spend much time inventing his own experimental this is, equipment. This is the Mark 15. It, uh, it was much more complicated originally. It's been simplified and simplified. You will see the same layers again that I've just talked about. It really is lovely stuff. There we are. Oh, yes, that's a nice core. At the top of the peat, the sedges and mosses are actually growing, creating new material. Below that, a layer where they decay in the presence of oxygen. 
Then the decayed vegetable matter collapses until the peat is compressed and impermeable. Water drains off sideways and everything below is permanently waterlogged. And it's really very decomposed, highly humified, and beautifully gooey. This is an attempt Chimo to get gas to samples that decay from down in all the, the way down to the base of the bog. A helium cylinder. To prove it, he's been looking for the gas produced by decay. We suspect that um, gas methane and carbon dioxide may be produced in measurable amounts deep down in the pit. But the difficulty is to get a sample of the gas to analyse. Uh, so we devised these collectors, which we're now going to put into the ground, and they will eventually become filled with gas from deep down in the peat, and we can sample them through a tube which comes up to the surface. We fill them with helium gas, and the collectors themselves are condoms attached to the end of a piece of plastic tube. We use condoms because they're manufactured to um, high standards, and they're made of very thin rubber, and they uh, therefore prevent the water getting in, but they allow the gases to diffuse in very easily. I'll just seal the aluminium around the rubber bar, and then put it in the end of this uh, hollow steel tube. The pressure pushes the syringe plunger out. After a month in the ground, the helium in the condom gradually gets replaced by gas from the bog, and he can collect the sample from the tube coming out of the ground. I'm afraid it's not going to inflate. Yes, it is. It inflated itself. But I felt it, and you won't have seen it. Nevertheless, there's a nice sample. Uh, let's move on. Um, the production version is like that, um, a good deal, the principle is just the same. There's an outer protection for the condom set over a solid um, tube inside with holes in it for the gas to diffuse through. And again, there are two places where you can attach tubes to and take the gas out. And Initially, we took it out in um, syringes, as you saw, um, but later on it got all very fancy like this. So, how can we tell if decay does continue? Well, clearly, uh, one way uh, that we can't measure it directly because it's much too slow but we can measure the concentration of the dissolved gases. Um, this was done with another production version, slightly different. The ones I've shown you for taking big samples. Uh, this one uh, has a membrane over a spiral groove and the same two tubes going up to the surface. You put it down, you leave it for an hour, and that's long enough for it to equilibrate, and then you can drive out the sample and make measurements on it. How do you make the measurements? Well, you use a quadrupole mass spectrometer. This is an instrument well known to chemists, but ordinarily confined to the lab. Um, here it is out in the summer with Deborah Pierce operating it. Uh, very nice when it's sunny, uh, not so nice when it's raining. You will have noticed here that you can make measurements at a number of different places simultaneously. You do them in sequence, so the hour um, is while these are equilibrating, but in sequence. 
Now, these are the sort of results. Here is the concentration of the gas. It's expressed as partial pressure, but it's essentially a concentration. And here is the depth down to 700 and something centimetres here, about seven metres, probably twice the height of this lecture theatre. And you will see that both carbon dioxide and methane uh, are in highest concentration down at the bottom and lower concentrations you get near the top. The only way that this could happen, there are two possibilities. One is that there may be a source of gases beneath the peat bog. Well, for reasons I haven't time to go into, we know there isn't. The other is that the gases are being produced by continuous decay. And the only way you could get a higher concentration down the bottom is if they are actually being produced in situ and still are. Um, so let's look at the way that the peat actually accumulates. Uh, this is a common sort of peat bog, a raised bog, um, and you can calculate what to expect by doing two things, working out the rate at the centre and the cross-section or shape. Um, at the centre, let's say, at the beginning here, this is the amount of peat there is, much exaggerated, here's the amount that's been produced in the first interval, let's say a year. Here is the small amount that's been lost in that time, maybe 20% of the whole. So the net effect is add that, lose that, and the total amount goes up a bit, about that amount. 2,000 years passed, much more peat has accumulated, same amount being added in a year, same rate of decay, but now applied over a much larger depth. So the total area of that column is almost the same as the total area of that square, the amount that was being added. And the net effect is that the top doesn't go up by anything more than a minute amount. So that what you expect is that the rate of accumulation will be quite rapid to begin with, but will slow off with time. Um, now the shape in cross-section is determined by the hydrology, and here's another set of small cartoons. Here's an enormous concrete-walled container, a kilometre across, filled with sand to a depth of five metres, and with little holes down at the bottom so that water can flow out. Um, the rain is started, it trickles down vertically and it fills up this bottom section and begins to overflow out through the sides. It goes on raining and gradually you begin to get this curved water table because anything that's here can flow out without much resistance. It's close to the exit. But if you're in the middle of the crowd here, you're impeded by all the other uh, people in the way. And so um, it takes you longer to get out and so the water builds up there. The physicists, like the chemist, will have to forgive me for this explanation, but it gives the right impression. And eventually you get to a point where the rate of flow off is exactly equal to the continuous rate of addition at the surface. And that, in the simplest case, is an ellipse, half of an ellipse, a sort of rugby ball shaped but in two dimensions. So now we'll have a simulation of a peat bog growing over 10,000 years takes 10 seconds to see it, see it and there will be a repeat because it looks a bit complicated. I'll explain what's happening when it stops. First of all, the green represents the living surface and the brown underneath it, the top of the peat, it ought to be that right the way through but if it were you wouldn't be able to see other things. This is the ghost of 
where surface was when it first formed. It formed at that point with the big circle and it has sunk down quite a lot because decay has continued. Uh, the same, for instance, for this one. Here's where it formed and it sunk down to there. So you have this apparent, it's only an apparent paradox, that although everywhere is sinking down, the peat bog as a whole is still growing upwards. The other thing that you see here are pools. These tend to form where the surface is flattest because there's nothing to drive the water off the sides. And they tend to be biggest in the middle and you may remember the picture at the beginning which showed the pools at the top of a domed bog like this. The little graph at the side shows the height that's been reached after 10,000 years here. Here, a faint line shows what would have happened if there were no decay at all. This is what happens with decay. Nowadays, I'm told this is all much too simple. There are all kinds of specialist features of the hydrology. But the general picture remains the same. And this is easy enough to understand. The later knowledge is much more difficult to cope with. Uh, there's the central pools, and here is the repeat. But instead of starting at the middle and spreading out, this one begins over the whole area at the same time. And again, you see the surfaces sinking down at every level. So what happens to the products of decay? Um, to do that, we made a whole lot of measurements for which these collectors were devised of the um, carbon-14 concentration in the gases and in the solids. And that enabled us to put a time scale on this, up to 10,000 years. And here we have the peat itself the solid. Um, here we have dissolved organic carbon and you'll notice that this is actually quite distinctly different from this one. And when we come to the gases, carbon dioxide and methane, they're a lot different. It's quite clear that the dissolved organic carbon is moving around a bit. Um, the methane and carbon dioxide are moving around a lot more. How could they be doing it? Well, they can't be doing it entirely by mass flow. Uh, there must be diffusion. And to explain the difference between these, uh, mass flow or bulk flow and diffusion. So there are two sorts of ways that things can be moved by diffusion, where individual molecules knock into one another, and mass flow. Um, and we can demonstrate with a cartoon the sort of things that happen. Here is a train in London and it's going to Edinburgh somewhere off the screen and we pack in 150 people into um, a carriage in the middle of the train and off we go to Edinburgh. And when we get to Edinburgh the people in the train have spread about the train because they have knocked into one another and they have distributed themselves by about that amount. But of course, the whole group has been moved a vastly greater distance than the length of a train. And the general principle is that if you want to move things around, mass flow, uh, water flowing through tubes and so on, is the way to do it. And the general uh, belief is that diffusion is of importance only for short distances, the size of individual cells, say the width of a hair, 20 micrometers. Above that, it's too slow to be useful. Well, I had my doubts about that, and because we've got very long times available here, and Mike Williams, um, who is a nuclear engineer and solves this sort of problem um, before breakfast, uh, did this for me. And here is what we see happening. 
this again is a very simple imaginary experiment in which we have um, 700 centimeters deep there and relative concentration along here. It's actually log scale, but if you don't know about log scales, it doesn't much affect the understanding. Here's the slug of a gas that we've put in at that point, dissolved in a liquid. After a month or so, this very faint uh, point here shows that there has been some distribution after a month, after a year, there's more, and after 10 years, some of it has reached the surface. Down here, you'll notice, it's becoming a bit asymmetric. And after 100 years, this has become very obvious. Um, the reason is that you can imagine the molecules at the bottom trying to move sideways but actually bouncing off the impermeable bottom. And after 1,000 years, we've got this curve, which is pretty close to the one that we actually measured uh, the methane and carbon dioxide concentrations. And those calculations show that after 10,000 years, 10 millennia, about 99% of the gases that have been produced in decay have reached the surface and disappeared into the atmosphere. Diffusion, give it enough time, is an extremely effective way of moving around the gases produced in decay. Now, a few reflections about the things I found particularly useful. Um, I had very good schooling in the basic sciences and a number of other things, and I was encouraged to do experiments and to use the workshop. Not at that age to very great effect, but I learned what was possible. Uh, when I got started on research, uh, I, of course, used observation uh, and experiments and applied simple chemistry, physics and maths to the sort of problems I came across. Particularly important was that I'd been writing computer programs, not just applications, but programs, since 1963, and that's been extremely useful. And lastly, on this list, uh, I've had access to a good interactive workshop. That is a workshop where you can take them along a problem, a sketch of how you think it, something might be built. Um, they will look at it and say, Mm, it would be better if blah, 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 blah. And with a bit of give and take, you get something that does the job. Nowadays, you're expected to go to a commercial workshop where you have working drawings and no interaction. So uh, it makes the kind of thing I've been doing uh, virtually impossible. The take home message that the bog moss sphagnum has extraordinary properties and is extraordinarily successful. Um, and in death as peat, it's accumulated about a quarter of all the organic carbon on the Earth's surface. And lastly, you may be familiar with uh, this genre of landscape with figures and sheep. And here is my version of it. Peatscape with colleagues, Barry Giles and Richard Nichols, um, recording at a distance the water level in tubes, because if you go any closer, it actually modifies the thing you're trying to read. Thank you.